Good afternoon, everyone. Um, a very warm welcome to all of you in yet another chapter of our, of our webinar series, Let's Talk Genomics with Experts. Uh, the theme of today's event is hereditary cancer in clinical practice. As we all know, hereditary cancers are caused by mutations in certain genes and passed from parents to children. Example of uh, such cancers are hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, leaf remedy, Cardin syndrome, and Lynch syndrome. A uh, clear understanding of hereditary cancer is required for an effective diagnosis, clinical care, predicting the drug effect, diagnosis of related cause, and many more purposes. Uh, to understand more on these aspects in today's discussions, we have Dr. Amrit Kaur Kalev. She will uh, talk about some hereditary cancer cases in clinical practice. So uh, to introduce Dr. Kalev, she is a good friend of mine. She uh, is a consultant in molecular pathology at Kokila Ben Dhirubhai Ambani Hospital and Medical Research Institute, Mumbai. Uh, Dr. Kaler is a molecular pathologist and she is trained in clinical genomics testing of solid tumors and hematological malignancies. Uh, her top research area is immunotherapy along with new targeted therapies. She is skilled in managing laboratory operations across department of uh, histopathology, hematology and clinical pathology. One of her current uh, interest area is connecting morphogenomics to precision oncology. She has uh, more than 25 papers to her credit in various national and international journals, and she has co-authored a postgraduate pathology book. She is the recipient of multiple awards in the area of pathology and leadership. She is also a regular speaker at medical conferences and seminars. Dr. Kaler is, is uh, very passionate about women empowerment and helping women in rural India. So with this, I would like to call upon Dr. Kale to take today's sessions. But before that, uh, as I can see, we have a great mix of students, lab personnel, faculties, clinicians, and others in the audience today. Uh, please uh, feel free to interact with us and Dr. Kale in question and answer sessions. You can put your questions in the chat box while Dr. Kale is talking um, about uh, today's session. So uh, let us interact, uh, interact with each other in the question and answer session, but you can again put your questions while the uh, session is going on. So with this, I would like to call upon Dr. Kaler. We are eager to hear you now. Over to you. Thank you, Ashutosh. Um, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to have a deeper uh, you know, impact on uh, the different types of hereditary cancers, which we thought might help us in understanding the cancers in a, in a different perspective. See, there are different, many different types of hereditary cancers affecting the breast, ovarian, kidneys, um, and also in the stomach and colorectal. But the reason I chose this Lynch syndrome was because this uh, is the most common uh, cancer syndrome that we uh, see in a clinical practice. There are so many diagnostic tests which are available to uh, screen this cancer. And also the significance of those tests along with the germline testing is something which we need to focus on. Because as I say, there is a lot of, uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, treatments available for MSI testing and it is getting into as an agnostic marker. So the treatments, the immunotherapies is being predicted for MSI positive cases, whether it is in any of the organ systems. So I feel MSI positivity is something which we you know, need to take it to a next level to treat the patients for MSI edge. But as I see, not many patients are able to afford testing for TMB, but the testing for MSI is being available for people, for the common people. So uh, with that introduction, I think I will just move ahead and I will share my screen uh, for the presentation. So before I start, I would like to welcome all the uh, members here, uh, the students. My, uh, I, I really like to interact with the students because they have all the positive energy and you know the different ways to improve our clinical practice, to question ourselves and uh, to think in a unique way. And also the clinicians were a 
you know, close perspective is required to solve many of the higher questions which we need to address too. So I welcome you all for this important uh, topic, hereditary cancers. I'll start with the Lynch syndrome today and with the, in the future sessions, we can cover up the different syndromes, whatever is requested by the audience, and we can take up that and have a discussion on them. So uh, the main agenda is to define what is Lynch syndrome, how do we screen it, what is the significance of the Lynch syndrome, what are the different diagnostic tests, and I will take up a colorectal cancer prospect because there are so many cancers associated and it has been extensively studied in colorectal and endometrial cancers, but I, will, I have picked up one particular organ system so that you know we can take up from there. And then how this is, can be used as a prognostic value, as a predictive value, like the therapeutic value for chemotherapy and immunotherapy. And then we will have a case discussion of three different cases and see how this, how the diagnostics testing for Lynch syndrome helped in changing the scenario uh, for the treatment. And then I will conclude the session and take up the question answers. So what is Lynch syndrome? It is the most common hereditary cancer syndrome. It affects about one in 400 people and accounts for 3% of the new CRC cases. CRC is a colorectal cancer. In colorectal cancers, APC gene mutation, this is known as FAP, uh, familial adenomatous polyposis is the most common and Lynch is the second most common. But overall, the Lynch syndrome is the most common hereditary cancer syndrome we see in in, uh, in cancers. So the penetrance is quite high, about 85 to 90%. So if you have a mutation in the gene, the multiple generations will be affected and the probability of getting the cancer is quite high. And the, the typical age of presentation is young, 45 to 50 years, but the screening uh, you know, criteria, which I will discuss later, has to start up a little early. And many of the tumors or the cancers, they can uh, you know, present synchronous, you know, two cancers at the same time in the same patient, and metachronous, one after the other, one 10 years before and another 10 years after. And most of these MSI positive tumors or Lynch syndrome cases are right-sided, proximal colon cases. And the prognosis is definitely better than the sporadic cancers. And the differences between the Lynch syndrome and the sporadic cases will also be discussed in the, in the session. So what is the significance of the diagnosis for the Lynch syndrome? The patient is at risk for other cancers and they need appropriate surveillance. And the patient's relatives are also at the increased risk. It's not only one patient because this is autosomal dominant inheritance. So 50% of the cases, chances are there that you will, your 50% of the children will get that gene mutation. With the high penetrance, it's very, very important that you screen your children and your siblings if required. So the relatives are also at the increased risk and the, the level of surveillance has to be more. So other than the CRCs, we have endometrium, which is the second most common tumor. We have stomach, small bowel, hepatobiliary, uterus and pelvis, skin, pancreas, brain, hematological, soft tissue and larynx, and even the breast cancers. Lynch syndrome has been associated with the breast cancers as well. So many of the times the risk of Penetrance is 85 to 90 percent for colorectal cancers, which might decrease a little bit, but the reverse happens with the endometrial cancers. The risk of penetrance is higher in the endometrial cancers. The risk of getting an endometrial cancer increases by the age of 70 years. So, what is the etiology? It happens because of the mutations or the deletions. The deletions are more common of the mismatch repair genes, which are most commonly MLH1, PMS2, MSH2, and MSH6. So what happens because of these deletions, there is a defect in the, in the DNA replication. So when the DNA is uh, replicating, if there is a mutation, the DNA repair pathway is not working effectively. So it will not be able to repair the gene. So with the result, the defective microsatellites are getting produced and and, and these microsatellites are being remaining. And this is the what which causes the increased propensity for the cancer. So these, what are my microsatellites? Microsatellites are the short tandem repetitive nucleotide sequences which are spread throughout the genome. They vary in length from one individual to another due to the differences in the tandem repeats. Some one patient will have seven to eight, one patient will have five to six. So these are the microsatellites which produces the insufficiency, the, the replication errors. So we measure those replication errors in the test by PCR. So I'll talk about it later. 
So what happens is when there's a deficient MMR system, in, even if there's a nucleotide change, the, if, the, if it is deficient, the repair will not happen. So there's a defective DNA. So two things will happen with the defective DNA. Either the cell will die, or secondly, the cell will develop into a cancer. So this is one propensity. But if the DNA uh, repair genes are all right, the DNA is repaired successfully, and then there is no mutation and no cancer formation. So this is what happens with the DNA repair system. So how do you recognize the uh, Lynch syndrome? The first one is Amsterdam criteria is being followed to recognize the Lynch syndrome in which at least three relatives with a Lynch associated cancer should be there. And one of them should be the first degree relative, either the mother, either the brother or the sister or the mother, or at least two just successive generations are affected, or at least one Lynch associated cancer should be diagnosed in less than 50 years. And in this particular case, FAP has to be excluded and the tumor should be diagnosed histopathologically. So this is the Amsterdam criteria, which is applicable only for the diagnosis of the Lynch syndrome. But then we have a Bethista guidelines, which are for MSI H cancers. So these cancers are diagnosed who are less than 50 years. I mean, the MSI H testing is asked when the patient has a colorectal cancer and the patient is less than 50 years. And the patient also has a synchronous or metachronous colorectal or other cancers, or the patient has MSI H histology in less than 60 years. So colorectal cancers, again, one or first relatives, this is the same as Amsterdam criteria, less than 50 years, or second or third degree relatives, regardless of the age. So what happens when we screen them? So what is the, if there is a proband which is affected, which has to be treated, but if it is the relatives or if it is uh, which, which are screened and they are diagnosed to have a positive gene, so what do we need to do? The NCCN guidelines and the PERS has you know, laid some guidelines about the personalized management of these patients. So the colonoscopy has to be done every one to two years, not five to 10 years. And then, we have to have a proper screening for the endometrial, ovarian, gastric, renal, and brain cancers. So in the endometrial hystero hysterectomy can be done. And in the ovarian, obviously the hormone check can be done. In the gastric and the small bowel, again, ultrasound has to be done regularly after the age of 30 to 35 years. And urine analysis has to be checked for renal or transitional cell cancers. Even in the brain, we have to do a neurological examination. And in the breast cancer, all the breast cancer screening methods for mammography has to be followed after 30 years. So uh, when you have the positive gene, you need to screen yourself more regularly to prevent the cancer at an early stage to stop. So that's why they say prevention is better than cure. Now, so how do we test? Uh, this uh, Lynch syndrome, the screening can be done by IHC, uh, which will look into the MMR genes. PCR can be used. And then finally, germline testing can be used. And afterwards, uh, this counseling is being provided to all the family members after if, if it comes out to be positive. So the histopathology also has a you know very um, uh, important role uh, when you look at the colorectal cancers. Now you look at the slide, it is a uh, very poorly differentiated and it has it looked like a medullary appearance, like in the breast, you have inflammation, you know, inside the tumors and uh, you, you can see signet ring cells or also you can see uh, sometimes um, mucin, which is very, very common with the Lynch syndrome, MSI positive cases. And the very tumoral lymphocytic infiltrate, which is very, very important and which gives the throwaway diagnosis on histopathology that you might be dealing with a Lynch syndrome. So after you see that, you better go for an IHC for MMR genes. So when we uh, do the IHC, because of the gene mutation, there is, uh, you know, the defective gene is there. The gene is not getting expressed. The protein is not getting expressed. So the patients will show a loss of the expression of the different genes based upon their presentation. So HML1 uh, and PMS2 usually concur they occur together. And MSHS2 and MSH6, they occur together. So if you see a loss of expression on IHC, so it means there is, a, there is some mutation it can be a hypermethylation, it can be a mutation, but there is a defect in the genetic or the MMR gene function. So we don't know the reason, but there is definitely a defect. That's what we conclude from the IHC of these patients. 
So then what do we do? We go for hypermethylation testing. So I will just uh, explain this table very effectively. If there's a loss of MLH1, we go for hypermethylation. And if there is a methylation, there is no possibility of Lynch syndrome. We are probably dealing with a sporadic MSI. So if there is no methylation, definitely the, we have to go for a germline testing for these patients. So if there is a MLH1 expression, you also go for BRAF. And if the BRAF is positive, then there is no possibility of a Lynch syndrome because sporadic cases of MSI H plus BRAF mutation is a diagnosis for sporadic CRCs, not a diagnosis for a Lynch syndrome. So now uh, if uh, there is a germline mutation uh, is present, you call the patient as Lynch syndrome. If it is not present and the patient is more than 60 years, we can say that the Lynch syndrome is unlikely. And if it is less than 60 years, then we again go for um, other MMR somatic alterations. So many of them will have six to nine um, you know, markers which are available in the market. Now, the next one, uh, this is what I uh, emphasized in the last slide, that if, if you're dealing with a sporadic cancer, you will have a MLH1 HIPM hypermethylation, BRAF mutation, and you might be dealing with an elderly patient more than 60 years. But if it is Lynch syndrome, there is a mutation, there is no BRAF mutation, and then this patient might be young, less than 60 years. And then the look, you look at the family history, you might probably get uh, you know, some grandfather, uh, you know, if not close, having uh, you know, some cancer in the stomach, or uh, you know, which will help you, which will give you a clue that you might be dealing with a, a syndromic cases. So what is MSI? MSI is a change in the length of the microsatellite allele because of the insertion or deletion of the repeat units during RNA replication. So this is a normal replication. You can see one chain is uh, getting into uh, you know, two different um, alleles. And now this is, this is a deletion and this is the insertion. So these are the variable alleles which has been formed. And this is the failure of the DNA mismatch repair uh, to correct all these mutations or sorry, insertions and deletions. Now, what is the principle for the PCR? We usually take uh, five uh, microsatellite markers, BAT25, 26, NR21, 24, 27. So BAT25, 26 are mononucleotides and then we have uh, dinucleotides. So uh, these uh, are able to uh, you know, compare, we take two samples, one from the blood sample, one for the tissue sample. So we compare the, uh, we put, put them in the PCR and then we do a fragment analysis for these mutations. And then we see if there is a microsatellite instability, you will get a clutter either on the right side or on the left side. So based on the insertions and the deletions. And if you see the clutter, it means there is an instability. It still doesn't tell you that there is a genetic mutation or what is causing this clutter or extra instability. So we still don't know. So it's just a diagnosis to tell you that we are dealing with the MSI instability. There's a defective DNA repair gene. It is because of hypermethylation or because of the insertions or the deletions or the mutation, we still don't know. So how do we report MSIs? We say if there is uh, no instability, we call it as MSS, microsatellite stable. And if there is one marker which is unstable, we call it as low. And if it is two or more markers, we call it as MSI high. So this is how we report the PCR for MSI. So what are the advantages? It's quite effective method to determine the instability. So, and if there is an instability, sensitivity is 93%, specificity is 100%. So MSI uh, may be positive sometimes when the IHC is negative. Sometimes some mutations, you know, might not express the proteins like the non-functional proteins that happens in nonsense, pro nonsense mutations. There is suddenly a stop code and, and there is no protein which is being formed, but there's a mutation, there's a Lynch syndrome. So it will not be picked up by the IHC. So in those cases, MSI testing by PCR is helpful. And it requires about 10% uh, of the tissue on the slide to, for the testing, and it is highly reproducible. When we say a limitations, uh, limitations can be, I'll be focusing more on the tissue base because sometimes we say, we refer that it is a mucinous tumor with the signet ring cells and a, a lot of inflammation is there because, and the medullary pattern, which also are the inhibitors for DNA extraction. So technical challenges it is sometimes important, which we need to deal with. And sometimes some Lynch syndrome tumors do not show the deficiency as I spoken early. It does not help to identify the gene uh, that is most likely mutated. 
that that is not in being informed for that need to a germline testing. So multi-panel, uh, multi-gene panel testing is typically cost effective than the targeted single gene testing. So uh, let's uh, look at the MSI status. What does that indicate? Uh, it, it just tells you an information on the prognosis. It tells you the information, the response to therapy, whether it's uh, chemotherapy or immunotherapy, and it is a screening tool for the Lynch syndrome. So let's see about the prognostic impact when we uh, look at uh, you know, four stages of the colorectal cancers. The MSI, if the patient is MSI positive, it has a better prognosis as compared to the MSS patient, stable patient. So MSI is actually carries a good prognosis for the patient. This is what this graph on the right side is indicating. So always remember MSI positivity is a good prognosis for the patient. Now, before I get into the treatment aspect, I thought this was something which was important to understand about the chemotherapeutic regimens, which I'm going to discuss in the next slide. We all know T2 and T3 are when it has not crossed the serosa, the tumor is still inside the gastrointestinal tract and it is still definable. And T4 is the one when it has crossed the serosa and it has undergone the metastasis. But sometimes in T2 and T3 tumors also, you will be able to see the uh, PNIs and sometimes LVIs, lymphovascular invasion, which might lead to the dissemination in other tumors. But T4 is the one in which the tumor has infiltrated the serosa and it, it has metastasized. So when we are dealing with the metastatic CRC cancers, the clinician will like to start on 5-fluorouracil or irinotectin. The reason is if the patient is MSIH, if it is high, 5-fluorouracil will not work. So that's why the clinicians want to understand if the patient is MSIH or not, even though it carries a good prognosis, but it the, this 5-fluorouracil, five, five this therapy will not work. So the clinician wants to rule out which therapy they need to start. And then we will have some targeted therapies as uh, I will discuss below. But if it is a early, uh, we have spoken about uh, stage three. Stage three is when, you know, lymph node is positive. Lymph node is positive, that is stage three. And in this case also, the, uh, the, the clinician wants to start the therapy, he will ask for the MSI testing. But if you are dealing with the T3 to T4, and there is no lymph node metastasis, we are dealing with the stage two. So in this, the clinician does not want to start a chemotherapy, but he will look for a additional prognostic markers. Why the patient will have, will the patient have a reoccurrence? Will the patient, uh, you know, needs the chemotherapy? What are the additional prognostic factors which need to be looked into before uh, the patient is asked to go home? So he will look into the histopathology report. He will look for perforation. He will look for occlusion. If the patient has lymph nodes, which are positive, poorly differentiated, LVI, or a lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion. So if all these factors are present and MSI is stable, the clinician will start the 5 fluorouracil The patient needs chemotherapy. So that is why the patient, uh, MSI is important to understand when to start the treatment and which treatment to start. So um, overall survival, this, uh, the figure is not very good, but you can see if the patient is MSI-L and the adjuvant chemotherapy, if it is given, the prognosis is better. We are not giving 5-fluorouracil, we are giving irononectin in this particular patient. If it is MSI-H and it is a late stage, the adjuvant chemotherapy will not help the patient. So before I uh, give it, enter into the immunotherapy, I would like to you know, emphasize on three different pathways which are important in CRCs. One is the chromos chrom chromosomal instability. Then we have the KIMP pathway, and then we have the MSI pathway. So we always a molecular subtype any carcinoma. So that, that is what is the holistic approach nowadays we follow. Whenever the patient, uh, cancer patient come, we want to understand whether we have a driver mutation or whether the patient, if the patient does not have a driver mutation, so the patient will deal with the chemotherapy and the immunotherapy will work. So 
तो दिस इज नोन एज अ पर्सनलाइज मेडिसिन दैट व्हाट टाइप ऑफ ट्यूमर आर वी डीलिंग विद सो दैट इज व्हाई द मॉलिक्यूलर सब टाइपिंग हैज बिकम सो इंपॉर्टेंट इन दिस प्रेजेंट एरा ऑफ पर्सनलाइज मेडिसिन दैट वी वांट टू अंडरस्टैंड आर वी डीलिंग विद रेजिस्टेंट म्यूटेशन और आर वी डीलिंग विद द ड्राइवर म्यूटेशन इफ इट इज ड्राइवर स्टार्ट विद द टारगेटेड थेरेपी बट इफ इट इफ देयर इज नो टारगेटेड थेरेपी इफ देयर इज नो टारगेट्स देन स्टार्ट विद द कीमो एंड लुक फॉर द एमएसआई और टीएमबी और इम्यूनोथेरेपी मार्कर्स एंड पुट द पेशेंट ऑन इम्यूनोथेरेपी so this is how is the holistic approach and every tumor or every patient has a different story to tell so that is why uh, in this slide i'm trying to say if we are molecular subtyping the colorectal cancers we are if we are dealing with the uh, chromosomal instability pathway we will be able to see keras and p53 mutations so keras in 12c sotorasib is now available in lung cancers but in uh, uh, colorectal cancers is still under trial but mec inhibitors are showing some good results in few of the trials but if we deal with the chem pathway we have a beta which is very very important and we have uh, again um, uh, you know raf inhibitors which are being used for beta as well and in the msi as we know that it's a marker for immunotherapy immunotherapy is indicated in msi positive tumors so this uh, slide was just to you know emphasize on the previous slide that if we are dealing there are two pathways in which uh, you can say the molecular pathogenesis of crc in the first one in the upper one we can see that msi is unstable okay and in the lower one we have a apc gene keras gene so this is the chromosomal instability and the upper one is the lynch syndrome that we are dealing with so the cause of the pathogenesis is different and if you are dealing with the msi the progression is so fast that the carcinoma happens within 3 to 4 years but if you are dealing with the apc gene it might take 15 years to get into a crcs so now you can understand that how important is to understand is to get into the details what type of cancer is the molecular subtyping is important to understand what type of cancer we are dealing with all right so in the first one we have ras mutation npegfr resistance that is something very important if you have a ras mutation then cetuximab which is a npegfr therapy which is being indicated in colorectal carcinomas is it will show a resistance so ras mutation is contraindication for an anti egfr therapy if we are dealing with the braf definitely these tumors present with a very high grade lymph node metastasis and we do have mec inhibitors uh, which are working on them but it is usually a high stage disease and elderly ancillary uh, tumors on the morphology on the histopathology is seen but if you are dealing with the msi you have Uh, you know options for chemotherapy you have options for immunotherapy which is very important and it carries a good prognosis and you can also look if we are dealing with the lynch syndrome because lynch syndrome has a better prognosis even from the sporadic tumors or uh, than the sporadic tumors with msi instability now this i think this is the treatment part which we have already uh, discussed so now immunotherapy if we have a msi h and the if uh, this this is a table a uh, kaplan mayer uh, you know table which shows uh, that the patients on immunotherapy with msi instability has a better overall survival than the patients who are showing mss who are who are mss stable now this was a few uh, clinical trials which i want to introduce in the ski note 164 uh, data we uh, this locally advanced unresectable metastatic crcs with msi msi were given a pembro 200 mg and for 35 cycles and what they found was that the median progression free free survival increased by 4 Point uh, one months and the twelve months uh, progression free survival increased by forty one percent. So pembro really helped in the colorectal cancers. So then, uh, then there was a checkmate one forty two in which the same uh, category of patients with the metastatic CRCs with the MSI positive, they if the patient was previously treated and metas again it has come to so nivolumab. or the combination of nivolumab or ipilimumab was tried in both the scenarios and then they compared what helped the patient better and in the single uh, io therapy the in the keynote 1016 there was 82% of the patients responded to immunotherapy and in checkmate 142 with the single immunotherapy 
about 36 to 20 plus 26, around 50 to 60 patients responded. And in the dual therapy also, the response was good. But then they wanted to understand, are we, if the presence of Lynch syndrome also, you know, helps, uh, uh, has responded better for immunotherapy, but that was not found. Whether you are dealing with a germline or somatic MSIH, Lynch syndrome or not, the response to immunotherapy was almost similar. Now, uh, the question is whether to go for a single IO or a double IO. So when we are, th these, this is a time when we decide on the toxicity profile of the patient, if, how much the patient is able to, you know, respond to one IO, then only we can, you know, get into the second IO. So on those cases, the liver function test, the fatigue, the diarrhea, and other parameters are need to be measured to start on single or a double IO. So MSI now has become a universal marker across solid tumors. So PEMBRO has been given and it has given them a 24 months PFS of increase by 53% and overall survival by 64%. So it has been approved by FDA uh, for PEMBRO for all the MSIH, it has been approved, but it has become a universal biomarker for all the solid tumors. So the next one, uh, uh, the, the use of testing, genetic testing for the germline mutation is done by next generation sequencing. Uh, we have it uh, in house and we are checking around 22 genes for colorectal malignancies, which include all the APCs and Lynch syndrome and MYTH. And all those syndromes are being uh, you know, screened for the population in any cancer uh, which the clinician finds it's appropriate with the common uh, family history. We put them for NGS uh, workflow. We extract the DNA, prepare the library, we assemble them, and then we do the bioinformatics analysis. And then we follow the ACMG guidelines here and we report them as pathogenic, likely pathogenic, a VUS, likely benign or a benign category. Uh, so, uh, so there are uh, what we discussed here was three different ways. The one was IHC, the second was PCR, and then we have NGS, uh, in which we could, you know, find out the MSI H instability, and then uh, germline confirmed us whether we are dealing with the deletion, mutation, or we are uh, with any genetic aberrations. What we are dealing with. So I want to uh, put up three case scenarios over here. So let's see how. Uh, we are able to you know, conclude from three different cases how to uh, treat different patients. So this is 65 year old female, she had an endometrial cancer and it, on histopathology, it was reported as moderately differentiated with the fecal grade uh, stage two and TNM was T1 and no uh, node metastasis and MMR was done on IHC, which was found to be positive. We did the MSI uh, by PCR here and we found four of the markers were positive. Four out of five markers were positive, and they were showing uh, an instability. And then we did the germline testing for the patient, and it came out to be negative. So MSI positivity does not preclude that you're dealing with the germline Lynch syndrome. So this was the take-home message from this case. So the detecting the mutations by MSI testing is the sensitivity is just 81%. We are not show that we are still dealing with the germline mutation here. So statistically, the challenges arises because it is not a gold standard. Gold standard is always a germline if you want to screen for Lynch syndrome. And always the studies are heterogeneous because the in both designs and populations, and the, sometimes the data is missing. So what I conclude from this uh, case is that MSIH is not a diagnostic, it's not a gold standard for germline mutation for Lynch syndrome. So 20% of the colon cancers will, uh, uh, will have MSI H tumors. And these, often of this, 15 to 20% will be Lynch syndromes, which are just four percent of the colon cancers. And uh, they are, you know, they, they, these tumors, if they are positive, go for the genetic testing and then go for, from the proband, go to the family. This is how it should be dealt with. So the case number two is 54-year-old right-sided colon cancer. The CT showed a solid mass in the colonic hepatic plexure. The diagnosis showed a poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. Again, it looks like poorly differentiated. You know, maybe we are dealing with a medullary. So one in 13 lymph nodes are positive and IHC and PCR for MSI, it both were showing MSS. But the beta was positive 
P67 was 80% and PDL score was 30%. So based on this positivity, the patient was started with Fulfox plus 5-fluorouracil because it's not MSI. And then we put the patient in bevacizumab. And then the maintenance therapy was given with IO and bevacizumab. So let's see what happened when we did the germline testing. We got the VUSS at two different spots in a CRCs. MH, MSH6, which is a, a you know, VUS, which is a specific marker for Lynch syndrome. And then we have a SMAD4, again, which is a marker for a colorectal hereditary cancer syndrome. So we got these two different mutations and all both in VUS and patient is presenting with a very high, uh, uh, you know, uh, lymph node metastasis and everything, MS is stable, but still we are getting the VUSs. So sometimes I feel, uh, it, you know, maybe we are not, we are getting VUSs, but we are not updating it with Linvar and maybe they are pathogenic, but they will be proved pathogenic in the coming years. So my uh, take home message is VUSs cannot be ignored completely if they are in the germline panel. Because somatic panel VUS, it might not carry a significance, but in the germline panel, if you get, it might lead to some other mutations, like other passenger mutations or lead to some other driver mutations, you know, because the DNA repair is not happening. So maybe something goes wrong and other mutations, you know, take away along the way and it leads to uh, a driver mutation. So uh, VUSS has been a lot of, uh, you know, controversy in, in the last few years. And it, uh, you know, some people say it may not cause cancer. Definitely, it doesn't cause cancer. It has not been reported in our ClinVars. So additional information may be required. And, uh, you know, you have to monitor that VOS every six months to understand if it has become pathogenic. There is no clinical action has to be taken. That's what has been defined by ACMG. VOS needs to be just ignored. But I see a lot of cases. Uh, recently, I had a case of uh, clear cell papillary carcinoma, and the patient also had an anaplastic astrocytoma. So we were thinking uh, maybe it definitely looks like a germline uh, brain and kidney. So we went ahead and did a germline testing, and we got a mutation BRCA2 gene. And also we had a mutation MLH6 and which were both were VUSS. So now this patient didn't have a driver mutation and he was resistant to chemotherapy. Plus he has these genes uh, VUSS in his germline. So how do I explain the cancer of this patient if I don't, I'm not dealing with the uh, driver mutation, the patient is resistant to chemotherapy and there are two VUSS which I don't know what to do. So VUSS are, something which we need to you know look into more deeply and start reporting more effectively to clinvar maybe there are some patients which are getting uh, you know associated with the cancers and you know we might have to go ahead and look more deeper into these VUSs. so then then this is a formula of uncertainty the patient experience of uncertainty in cancer genomics which i just read recently in this uncertainty you know the patient doesn't know what to do with this mutation he has this full you know 50 pages of report with him and then he has his VUSs within his hand and he doesn't know what to do so there has been a lot of issues about the factors and the outcomes of this reporting and the coping with the uncertainty this is a very beautiful article which i liked and i thought i will just put it across to the readers and uh, uh, for a better information. So case three, we have a 75 year old female uh, breast cancer, um, modified radical mastectomy was done and she was reported with an invasive micropapillary carcinoma with the mucin grade three. So after this, uh, uh, she we underwent directly for MSI, the sample came directly for MSI, all the five markers, five out of five were unstable in this particular case. And breast is something uh, which we don't expect to have MSI instability in the very rare cases. But when we did the germline for this patient, because very high grade, so MLH1 was positive and it was supposed to be pathogenic. So breast ca cancers with the Lynch syndrome has been very few case reports has been reported. And we had one mutation in MLH1 in the breast case, that also in papillary, because papillary, I remember in breast cancers, we are dealing with ARID1 or we are dealing with the uh, PIC3, but very rarely as a germline with MSI, that is something which is very rare. So if you're dealing with genetic aberrations, uh, M the deletions of exon 16 is something which is more common, which, which, we, which we see. And then we have a splice, except the site of exon six, 
which is the next most common. We have a stop potent, and then MSH2, MSH2 also shows a substitution or a splice donor variant or deletion of exon 1 to 6. These are something uh, which are very commonly seen in the Lynch syndromes. And then uh, we just I just try to see which all uh, mutations are more common in the population. And many uh, authors, they came forward that MSH2 is more common, but then there was some studies which showed MLH1 and MSH2 are equally common. But then in Kukula Ban, I also uh, took out my data and I found that MLH1 was more common in, the, in our uh, data statistics. So, um, and the deletions are more common. And this case also, which we dealt was a deletion of uh, nucleotides. So uh, I think uh, I'm done with my talk. I hope I have made my points very clear. And this is my hospital here. Uh, thank you so much. And I am ready to take up some questions. Great. Thanks for an insightful discussion, Dr. Khalil. So the forum is now open for question and answer session. So I do see a couple of questions and a few more which have come directly to me. Uh, the first question I would take is most of the viewers in germline cancer will likely be classified as uh, likely benign or benign, and most of these variants are missense and are private polymorphism. So for this reason, we use a new class named as VSD, hmm. uh, probable damaging effect. So basically, it's more like suggestions and adding on to your uh, discussions about that uh, many of those viewers are being uh, coming up and is not being classified as, a, uh, you know. Uh, causing mm -hmm. right, so, right. Yeah. thank you great so uh, the other question what i have is what is the penetrance of lynch syndrome as per the age brackets and the mm -hmm. population prevalence of lynch syndrome in the indian scenario see the, the penetrance is about 85 to 90 percent in lynch syndrome what happens is uh, the as the age advances it is usually a disease of the younger population 20 to 45 years if you have a Lynch syndrome, you will get a, a you know, malignancy in the colorectal. So with the age, the penetrance decreases. You know, by the age of 70, the penetrance of endometrial cancers become higher than the colorectal cancers. So this penetrance is, uh, I can say, if you have a gene which is pathogenic in a Lynch syndrome, you're probably going to get some cancer at, 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 a, at a young age, 45 to 50 years, you're going to get some cancer. But if you're lucky, if you didn't get a cancer, the chances of endometrial cancers becomes higher and it moves from generation. And if you have, obviously your children are, um, they are going to express the penetrance and they're going to express the cancer. Great. And uh, what are the criteria to use in uh, screening for a possible Lynch syndrome? So criteria we... for, yeah, the Amsterdam criteria. We Amsterdam. use it for okay. Amsterdam criteria. Bethesda mm -hmm. is for MSI. And Amsterdam criteria is for the Lynch syndrome. Okay, and how is the progress so far globally in the cure for Lynch syndrome? If you have any data information on this. Uh, See, no, it's, the, yeah, the, my experience is the prognosis of uh, Lynch syndrome. See, when we call it as a Lynch syndrome, you are telling the patient that you are having a propensity to have five different tumors in your lifetime. So if you get, you screen them and treat them at an early stage, okay? And if you don't know, if you present at a later stage and you haven't screened, there are chances of uh, immunotherapies which are available. So, and the, and the possibility of chemo and IO immunotherapy has been much better than the other cancers. So I can say the overall survival with immunotherapy in Lynch syndrome, Lynch syndrome means you will have MSIH positive. So all these treatments has been uh, you know, approved for MSIH, not approved for Lynch syndrome. Lynch syndrome, when we say, it is basically a hereditary cancer syndrome. So it's just an information to the patient that you have this mutated gene or some genes which are dilated and you need to take care for a lifetime. Suppose colonoscopy in US is you know, mandatory after every 10 years, every country has its own protocol. But if you have a Lynch syndrome, you have to do a colonoscopy every two years. So this is the way we deal with the cl clinical syndromes. But if you have it and you will be MSIH positive, IO and chemo carries a very good, you know, um, chances of survival, overall survival and PFS is pretty good. 
So what is the screening uh, rate? I mean, uh, you, you talked about colonoscopy. Is there any other screening tool that is generally used for uh, Lynch syndrome screening? No, no, uh, the, they have not, uh, other than the MSI, they have not, nothing has been approved. So okay. occult blood is something which is being used for colorectal cancers, but for Lynch syndrome, nothing else has been approved by NCC. Okay, and what is the uh, the uh, regular life? I mean, general life expectancy for somebody who is uh, having Lynch syndrome. Yeah, life expectancy again based on their screening tools, again based on your treatment, uh, based on your presentation of the cancer, whether what type of cancer it is, what stage it is. Mm -hmm. it, usually, uh, the I, I see the patients even at sixty years, so so it it is not that short as one thinks. It's it's a good. As compared to the other cancers, it's, it's a good humor. So, yeah. that's okay. Great. so uh, we talked about NGS in one of your slides. So uh, uh, how frequent is uh, NGS being utilized in diagnosis of Lynch syndrome and how is it being used in Indian scenario? Like See, right many... now, hmm. yes, thank you. Good question. Right now, there is not much awareness. So my, uh, what we are starting at Cochlear Brain is, uh, see, what I particularly feel is that we are trying to treat the patient using MSIH as the marker for immunotherapy. But now, if the patient is given a germline testing, you know, beforehand, so we, uh, I just want to bring up this panel for germline testing in all the cancers. You know, it's not only for the treatment, but also for, uh, uh, you know, getting the people aware because it is just 50 to 20% of the tumors are as associated with as hereditary cancers. So right now there's not much awareness, but I, uh, but we, I want that it should be included in the proper screening tools when we do a preventive health checkup. So in that also, it should be included that you can do one germline testing to understand your genomics and how, you know, you can uh, plan your lifestyle and change your habits and all these things can be a modification to uh, to prevent the syndrome to express the tumors so uh, i see one more questions in my chat box can lynch family members be screened using their regular screening methods yes yes they should be screened yes okay. yeah they, it is an autosomal dominant condition so if one has it if there are four kids definitely two kids are positive so and if you can reiterate that the screening methods again uh, for, for the benefits of audience, like what, what are the different tools and different screening methods being utilized? All right, screening uh, screening is see what we there is one absolute criteria which is based only on the family history. Okay. So at least three relatives with Lynch syndromes, Lynch syndrome associated cancers, and one of them should be first degree. First degree means brother, sisters, mother, or father, or children, or at least two successive generations are there. Father had it or grandfather had it. If grandfather had it, the father should have it. Two successive generations. And at least one Lynch associated cancer should be less than 50 years because it presents at, at the younger age. So these are the uh, you know diagnostic criteria which are included in the Amsterdam's. And the diagnostic tools is you can go for MM. MSI testing, MSI testing by blood, but that is only on the tumor tissue. So best is to go for a germline testing directly, give your blood sample and get a germline testing done. That is the best way to screen yourself for a Lynch syndrome. So um, I don't see any more questions in the chat box. Um, uh, audience, if you have any more questions, you can put it here right in the chat box, either in the chat box or question and answer window. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then I would like to wind up here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amrit Kaler, for such an insightful talk. We are looking forward to having you again for any such event in future. Thank you very much for being part of this webinar. And I would also like to thank audience for their uh, presence in today's sessions. So uh, whosoever there in the audience, please reach out to us with ideas and suggestions. We would like to be part of any such program and love to extend support required from all the sides. And thanks again for your presence. Please take care of yourself and have a great rest of the day. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone.